Hello. Okay, so I guess we can start the tour. So you know me already. Um, I'm here with my colleague Andres, who will go down and show you around CMS. Um, yeah, we are working together in the same group for, um, for the luminosity measurement of CMS. And uh, here is also Adelina, uh, who's working on the trigger mainly. And also there's, uh, you can say hi, sorry. No, I just want to say hi, everybody. <laughs> And there is Zoltan and Noemi with us, and they will help us uh, to organize the tour nicely. Okay, so I think we will, you want to say something about your, yourself or? I have a technical comment, if possible. Um, we have uh, one room connected. Uh, they can interrupt us at any time. Right. So if they have any question or comment, please don't hesitate. Turn your microphone on and, and tell it to us. Sorry, I have to put it on. Um, for the attendees, the other attendees connected online, please use the, the question and answer on the bottom, and then we will see the questions and we will answer them. Perfect. Thank you. Why don't I see the QA? That's okay. Okay. Uh, right. You go ahead. Like, you can say a word about yourself. Okay. Great. Yeah. So I'll start with uh, with me. So, like Joanna said, my name is Adelina Lintulota, and I'm originally from Finland, but I'm currently doing a PhD here at CERN, and my host university is in in Germany, um, KIT Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and um, and uh, so my project here at CERN is I'm working with the high level trigger system. And uh, you'll probably hear a little bit more about it when we go down and we pass the racks where you can see all of the PCs. And um, uh, and yeah, I'm a first year PhD student, so I might be kind of similar knowledge to some of you because Jana filled me in and said, you're all students, masters and PhD students. So um, um, but yeah, I'm happy to be here and answer questions where I can. Cool. So very quickly, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Andres, as Jana said. And I am a postdoc right now. Um, I guess I've been in the collaboration for a bit longer. I won't even, I won't tell you how long. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, that doesn't mean I know more than these guys. So uh, I'll try to keep up. <laughs> yeah, I'm originally from Puerto Rico. And uh, yeah, I, I guess associated with US institutions, but uh, based here in Geneva. And yeah, that's where I get started. Yeah, hi. We start with the control room, right? Yeah. OK. So we are sitting now in the CMS control room, and uh, I, I actually we're sitting in your area, right? Because this is uh, the, 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 the trigger, <laughs> trigger desks <laughs> where, where we start the, the tour. But Anders will shortly, Noemi will shortly show you the um, different parts. So um, it's a place where, where we um, steer the detector. So it's uh, basically that we have the steering wheel here of, of all the, 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 the parts of, the, of CMS. And yeah, so you already see the view for to, to the other side of the room and you see some people around. So there is always a um, technical shifter and shift leader around who are basically responsible for the, the communication between the, all the CMS subsystems. Um, and yeah, they, they keep track on, on all the alarms or um, yeah, the communication of whatever is happening currently. Um, you want to proceed, Andres? No, you are muted. OK, so I can say a few more words. So yeah, this is the technical shifter desk. And you can see there's many cameras and there's many, uh, lots of monitoring. You can see, for example, this has to do with the cooling. And all parts of the detector are monitored. This could be things like low voltage, high voltage, cooling. Uh, sometimes there are, there's all kinds of alarms. But you can see this is sort of the, the main way that we monitor all aspects of the experiment. And then we have, yeah, the shift leader, who is the captain of the boat at the moment and is in charge of basically everything, coordinating with the other subsystems. And just to show you the other desks we have here. So where uh, our team is sitting is usually the trigger desk. And we'll talk more about the trigger later. And we have the DAQ desk here, which is, it has the very cool big green start button. So that's the magic button you press to actually start collecting data. Cool. So let me show you this other room very quickly. 
And this is called, this is what we call the sub detector room. And here we have, uh, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> so a few colleagues are here working hard. Uh, hi. And um, we have several sub systems here. So generally on this side, we have the muon systems. There was plenty to say about the muon systems, but we'll uh, talk about that a bit later. And then on this side, we have the pixel and tracker subsystems. And then we have the calorie emitters here and uh, also a new uh, subsystem, a new muon system that has very cool um, kind of funny, uh, I don't know, images <laughs> posted around. And uh, yeah, maybe that's good for an introduction. Uh, John, you wanna take over? Yeah, I can take over if you if can, could you put my slides up so I can show you about the, how the different layers of um, CMS are, are, are built. So Dan, could you put up my slides now? Mm -hmm. And in, like in the meantime, Andres will go because uh, he has to take a lift to go downstairs actually, but I can show you where he's going as soon as I have them. <laughs> so basically, I can just, just a little moment. I, oh yeah, that's over there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> can I move them around? Or? Yeah, I can move it. Okay. Yeah. So this this picture you already you already seen. So you, we can just move forward. Forward. Uh, yeah. This already. Yeah, this is already in the introduction. Was there? The next one. Mm -hmm. Right. You're so the. Fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there was two hours of the introduction. Where Don't worry. Skip the basics. So yeah. So what the, the main purpose of the of the of the uh, detector? Let's let's start with that. So um, at the LHC, as you as you heard before, we have like four, four main um, experiments, and two of them, which is CMS and Atlas, are the general purpose detectors. And what we do here is basically the study particle physics, and the um, to our understanding, the best description for it currently is the standard model. And so um, in there we have different types of, um, of par particles, um, the, the fundamental par particles. So we have uh, quarks uh, on the left top uh, li listed and then the leptons and the different kind of, kinds of bosons responsible for, for different um, forces. And of course, we also have there the Higgs boson, which was discovered here by also by CMS um, in 2012. Okay, so if we move forward, right, there's a picture of the- from Everybody's the, so happy. <laughs> yeah, everybody's so happy about the, so happy about the discovery. Um, oh, yeah, I'm on the picture. Oh, you're yeah, there, it's awesome. there. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> you can find yourself out on there. <laughs> nope. Okay, great. Okay, so let's ahead. move on to the uh, CMS. One more, please. This was already there. So you can see where we are sitting with Adelina at the, at the, at the surface in CMS and when, where Andres is going, he's actually showing in with the camera. I know you cannot see that probably. No, not at the same time. But um, of course they can see it on the side. Right, so he's, he's going downstairs and, and um, in the, the lift is showing that he's going about 100 meters uh, below the ground. So um, the, the LHC, um, uh, is below ground, but it's uh, on, on uh, like the different depths uh, depending on which side of the accelerators uh, you are at. So if you're closer to the lake, it can be like 60, 70 meters. But if you are closer to Jura where we are in SESI in France, then it's about uh, 100 meters down. Okay, maybe Andres, you want to say something because you're already underground. I think I give him back. Yep. Uh, so we wanted to show you really quickly, sorry to interrupt, but we have a few cool things that we can show. And uh, we are not really all the way underground. We're just at the what we call the first level. And I'm gonna tilt the camera up. Yep. Oh, that's Noemi's showing me a trick. Oh, this is awesome. Okay, so here you can really see this is just the elevator shaft. So this is one of the sort of the main way that we access the detector. But there are other shafts uh, that allow us access to the detector. And I really quickly wanted to point out this. Um, sort of tubing, uh, these tubes we have here, you can kind of see that they go in and they go all the way to the surface through the elevator shaft. So these are actually uh, associated with the magnet, the superconducting magnet system. And this is the way that we remove the current if there's a quench. So if we lose superconductivity in the magnet, 
we will run about 18,000 amperes of current through those very thick wires and send them up to the surface. Otherwise, our magnet will explode. Uh, so we'll take you through uh, some of the cryo system that is basically the way that we provide uh, or keep our magnet cold. And I'm afraid I don't know too much about this systems, so I can't tell you all the details. But one thing that I know is that this is not particularly a very unique solution. Uh, so any sort of industrial cryogenic system will look a bit like this. But I kind of wanted to show you guys this area because it's something that, to be honest, most people in the experiment are don't even don't ever look at this area. In fact, doing these virtual visits, you get to see so much of the experiment, you usually don't. Uh, so I wanted to take the opportunity to show you guys and uh, you can even go, uh, we can't go on top here. So, but yeah, there's lots of systems. And yeah, I wanna hand it over to you, Joanna. I just wanted to show you that. Okay. So that system, so I haven't managed to arrive there in the introduction, but that system is um, for our superconducting magnet. So you have extremely powerful magnet in, in, uh, inside the CMS uh, volume, which is uh, for Tesla. Um, and then the, like Andres was, was, was showing you where uh, the current gets um, taken out in case of quench, which is of order of like 18,000 uh, amperes. So it's a huge current uh, flowing there. And this, the size of the, the magnet is about uh, 13 by six meters. And it provides us with a, a nice uniform film, uh, field uh, uh, inside. So that uh, for the system, which are uh, in, uh, for the tracking or a, a calorimeter system, which are in the, in the central part of the detector, uh, we have the field that, so that it can bend uh, trajectories of the particles if they are charged and, and, go and pass through so that we have additional information about these particles. Um, you read it? Yes, so maybe let's move on to the pieces because I wanted to make an introduction. This one is fine? Or uh, yeah, this one is fine. It's okay. okay. So we, you will shortly see the cross section of CMS. So um, you can see that in the very central part in the beginning, we have the interaction point. So you can imagine that the, the, the two protons uh, collide there and, uh, you know, many things can happen. But um, so the, the CMS is basically be, built like an onion, so it has many layers. And first of all, we have the silicon tracker. Um, actually, it's composed of the pixel, um, so, so, so that we can detect where the, the vertices uh, were produced. And then we have uh, the additional tracker strips so that we have the information about the trajectories of these particles. Then the next, in the next uh, step, we have the electromagnetic calorimeter. So this is, um, these are crystals, so um, these are lead, um, a tungsten crystals, which are like uh, very interesting. So they, 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 they are purely uh, transparent, but it's very interesting to, to, to know that they are composed of like more than 80% um, of metal actually. So you can just imagine that you hold a, a cup of coffee and it suddenly weights uh, 1.5 kilograms. Um, and uh, thanks to them, we can detect the um, photons and electrons, which are stopped, uh, produce shower inside, inside these crystals, and then we can detect them. Um, then in, as a next layer, you have the hadron calorimeter, so it's uh, to uh, stop the neutral and charged hadrons. So it's, it's built out of um, brass absorber. And it's very interesting, actually, that this brass was uh, basically recycled from um, the shells of, of uh, missiles uh, that, that belonged to the Russian Navy uh, during the, the Second World War. And then they, they recycled it, they, they, they melted it basically in St. Petersburg and, and built an absorber out of it. And so the hadrons get stopped there. And then we also uh, detect them, um, the energy that, uh, that was absorbed uh, with the scintillators. And then, so then next comes the superconducting solenoid that you, you we were described already. And in the, as the next part or the last layer is the something that the CMS, as the name uh, points out, uh, is specialized at, so uh, the muon chambers. And uh, it's interleaved actually with the, uh, the iron return yolk, so that to return the field of the solenoid. I think, I think I'm just, you're showing some pict nice pictures, so maybe I pass it on to you. 
sure. I mean, I, I was just trying to show as you were talking the parts of the detector and this particular poster shows you the uh, sort of assembly process of the entire detector. And there's really lots of interesting things. Um, you know, one of the things that I don't remember if, we, if you mentioned already is that this site for CMS was built relatively recently. This, the rest of the site was built for the large, large, large electron positron collider. And you can see the construction here, and you can see that at some point they had to stop construction because they found remains of a Roman villa. Uh, and it was very challenging to dig through the soil because it, there's running water under the soil. So they had to freeze it to continue to dig the shaft to then lower the detector. So one of the things that I think is nice to point out right now is that you can see uh, that our detector, as Jonah was saying, was like a cylindrical onion and it's cut into slices. And we'll show you very specifically what this means, but you can see that they were, or well, they were assembled in the surface and you can see how they were lowered down one at a time, but that was still very, very challenging because the dimensions of these components was very much just a, a few centimeters of tolerance uh, with compared to the dimensions of the shaft. So this is another shot of the slices being lowered. So Joanna, I am about to go into the service cavern. Maybe you guys can say a few things as I show right. some uh, cool stuff. Right, so I can I can also like add that um, actually like the, so Andres mentioned that the pieces of, of CMS were lowered uh, one by one through the shaft. Uh, I can also, on the slides, I have some more pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 related to that, but so there were basically 15 pieces and the, the heaviest of them, which included the, the, the solenoid, mm -hmm. um, a bit uh, heavier, uh, uh, higher. Stage. Yeah, so the, there was a picture of the CMS excava uh, excavation yeah, this zone. One. Yeah, so this is just an really a picture of the, on the left of the shaft through, through which the Andres was saying that everything was lowered down, so everything was assembled above the ground in pieces, in those 15 slices, in this and, right, in this building, and then lower down through, through the hole that you, you see in the middle. Actually, this building has been extended over the, mm -hmm. the shaft, right. we once are, the shaft was ready. Right, we are actually sitting in the area that is uh, yeah, exposed. Uh, somewhere here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then um, actually the, the heaviest piece um, that Andres was saying that, the, that had just like few centimeters, um, um, acceptance like uh, next to the next to the shaft was lowered by 12 hours so it took a very long time to make sure that we don't um, destroy something on the way down and of course everything was then uh, put together um, in the cavern oh Andres are you showing us something nice now uh, well I can certainly do that um, so maybe I can say a quick word um, so this uh, area here is what we call the service cavern. Some people call it, call it the counting room. And basically we, this is where we collect or, well, we sort of funnel a lot of the detector data through these kinds of things. And this is, I would say, sort of a typical looking setup where you have data from the, the detector that is uh, basically traveling through fiber optic cables and they go through these FPGAs. So that's a very common way to process the data. Um, but in particular, this system is, uh, is belongs to the trigger system, but I'll also show you several other subsystems. And maybe I can actually show you this one in particular, which Joanna uh, works on often, and she can maybe tell you a word about what this is. Right, so, so where Andres is, um, uh, so, so it's, it's a, maybe the, just to give you an overview so that He's in the cavern, which is basically aligned adjacent to the to the main experimental cavern, and this is um, pretty special that uh, we have an access there uh, during normal operation, like no other experiment uh, can do that. So that it's um, it's sheltered from from the cavern with few meters uh, concrete wall, of course. And then this is the part which is actually the brain of our detector. So the, here li lays like all the off-detector electronics, and so this is basically the ba the back end, the readout system. Uh, for, for our luminometers that we use in CMS. And so then there you have the, all 
uh, information flowing from the, through the optical fibers and then we histogram there okay it's not very beautiful <laughs> but uh, it's not it's not the point here right so, to I align think, it I think this is the the traditional view what people think of uh, the experiments <laughs> right and yeah this it is doesn't very... have to be it doesn't have to be beautiful as long as <laughs> I would say the impressive thing is that there's somebody who knows which what each cable does and where each cable goes right. and that might oh, be yeah. you actually <laughs> right. and that's even more impressive when you look at what it looks like <laughs> right <that's true. laughs> Okay, yeah, so, so that's... maybe I can also very quickly add that there's many, many systems, right? So these orange stripes indicate that indicate that these are racks that continue to have power even after a power a general power cut. Um, and often inside of these racks, we have PLC systems. So these are programmable logic, but they basically protect the detector in the case of certain conditions, right? If there is uh, some kind of temperature com condition or humidity condition, then parts of the detector need to be either powered down or some action needs to be taken automatically. And that needs to happen regardless of whether there's power available or not. So we need uninterruptible power uh, to be able to do all of that. And it's a lot of it is for machine protection or, or detector protection. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of other systems that are for human protection. And uh, we haven't talked too much about it, but there's a lot of emphasis also on safety and we can talk a little bit about that, but I'll hand it over to you, Joanna. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as, as Andrew said, like safety is very important. So I don't know if, you, if you've seen that, but um, before he entered the cavern, actually there was a gate which scanned his, uh, his eyes so that to make sure that this person has access and he, he, like, this person can go down. There are also like multiple warning systems about the, like if there is uh, the, the, the magnet is on, then um, the, yeah, the, the, it's, um, there is a warning or maybe Andres, you can show on the way like that there's um, systems which uh, measure the oxygen level um, inside the caverns, the multiple radiation detectors that, that um, um, detect the, the ambient uh, dose that um, is there. Maybe Madeline is good time. So if you want to say something about the trigger, because this is where yeah. the trigger is based. Yeah. So Andres mentioned a bit um, about the data acquisition system and about the trigger, but maybe just a bit more if you're interested. So CMS has kind of a two tire trigger system. And uh, the reason why we have it is because we produce a lot of events. We have a lot of collisions and we see a lot of particles coming out of, the, out of those collisions. But the thing is that the majority of them are not so interesting. They're just very, uh, low energy multi jet events and the very interesting events are quite rare and that's also why we create so many collisions we wouldn't have to produce all these collisions if the interesting events happened very often so we produce a lot of collisions but we only want to know information about a small subset of them so we have a trigger system that tells us if we had an interesting event there or not so we have a two tire trigger system we have the level one which is custom designed hardware and then we have the uh, high level trigger system which is just software on PCs. So there's just your typical C++ and Python code. And basically what happens there is that um, uh, they have to make a decision very quickly. The level one trigger makes a decision in 3.8 uh, 3 microseconds. And to do this, we have to have a lower resolution um, uh, of the event. So you can think of the detector um, measures everything that happens in the event. And, um, and the level one trigger takes this information, duplicates it, puts one part into kind of a front end buffer to store it uh, and wait for a global decision if it should keep the event or not. The other part goes into the level one um, uh, trigger system that creates a primitive. So it's like a lower resolution of what happened in the, in the collider. So we have fewer channels, uh, lower bit sizes, is basically just a lower resolution to be able to make a decision quicker. Then we reconstruct the full event with everything, all of the software. Or actually, it's not everything that goes in there. The tracker information does not go in there, but information about the immune system and about calorie meters. And then we reconstruct the event and we make a decision. And how do we make a decision? Where, for example, we look for clues on interesting events. So a high energetic muon is a good idea that something interesting happened there. Um, uh, there's lots of different uh, clues we can look for if we want to keep the event or not. But basically, if if we keep the event to the level one trigger, then it goes on to the high level trigger that kind of increases the resolution a bit more. So have a little bit better reconstruction again. And we again pass it through a lot of filters and we say, do we want to keep the event or not? So, so it's kind of an idea there of why do we produce so many events? It's because the interesting ones are very rare. And then we have a very sophisticated trigger system to make sure that in the end we only have interesting events left or 
the most interesting ones. <laughs> mm -hmm. We so, still have a lot of non-interesting things, but that goes into the analysis. <laughs> actually, I have one number in my head, which is uh, uh, the probability of creating Higgs at this uh, energy where we are running the, mm -hmm. the accelerator. And this is something like one in every 3,000 billion <laughs> collisions. Right. So right. this is extremely rare. What we are looking for is, is extremely rare. Right. Look at Andres. He is in the a tunnel. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Andres. Yeah, so of course, this is just a poster where we pose and take photos. And exactly, you know, this is part of the visitor's path. So we have visitors come down here and take photos in front of this big poster. Um, so, it, you know, something that you may not realize is that very few of us actually have access to the LHC tunnel itself. It's very, very controlled and you don't really go there at all unless you're directly working on that sort of stuff. So maybe we can show you also a few things, uh, again, which are interesting about the LHC, well, the LHC and the injection chain. So this is an older photo, but it shows you that, you know, the LHC has very humble beginnings and there's just a little bottle of hydrogen that can provide enough protons for the entire lifetime of the LHC. Now this has been replaced, this is from LINAC2 and there's a new, uh, let's, let's call it first chain of acceleration, which is LINAC4 and it's actually just commissioned, uh, it has been commissioned over the last few years, but it just came into operation very, very recently. So we're very excited to have this new linear accelerator. And you can see some of the components here, but I wanted to give you, I, I think you already have an introduction about the LHC, so I don't, I'm not gonna talk a lot about this, but I always like to point out that a lot of these are very historical, very old detectors. Some of these were commissioned in the 50s and 60s. And at the time they were the best and the, the most powerful and so on, but now they're sort of in service of the LHC. So we take these, uh, you know, like the SPS, for example, that, you know, we, well, a couple of people won Nobel prizes for their work at the SPS, but now the SPS is a service uh, accelerator that there are, for example, you can see actually some of them here, there are fixed target experiments that are not really related to the LHC, but it also services the LHC and provides pre-acceleration to the LHC as well. Uh, I, I just wanted to add one more word about sort of where we are and just something to show you that's very cool. So you can see uh, an overhead map or plans of where we are at the moment. Uh, so what we actually, I showed you the elevator shaft and that's what says, you know, it says PM54 here. So that's uh, the elevator shaft that we took. And then we showed you guys around, but at the moment uh, we are in here in the elevator, sorry, in the service. This is what the service cavern is. And we're about to take this little tunnel, this little access through here. But you can see that it sort of goes, uh, takes a, a turn around this pilier. And this pilier is actually, a, I think, seven meter thick concrete wall. And this uh, provides enough separation you know, from the experiment, which is in this section here, uh, so that we can be in the service cavern down here at any, at any time, even during collisions, which is very unique for CMS. And yeah, it's, it also has to do, you know, the civil engineering is also very interesting, but uh, yeah, so there's reasons why it has to be seven meters having to do with this structural stability or something, but I don't know enough about that to tell you the details. But in any case, we're just gonna go around and uh, while we do that, I think, Joanna, maybe you can take over. Um, okay, so what else? Maybe we can go back to the, to the slides okay. I show you, show you some nice pictures. So what is um, one more? Probably this one. No, there was a the next one, right? Because this is maybe interesting for you as we uh, as you did the, the accelerator it's course. It's interesting for me as well. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you can, you have a scheme on the right of the the interaction re region and IP five, and if you remember at the course we were we were talking that um, I mean LHC provides us with the, the cutting edge uh, luminosity, and so how how we do that actually like we squeeze. We've learned that before, right? That we squeeze the beams to the maximum possible, and this is done uh, with so a special alignment of the quadruples that you, you can see next to the IP. Oh, yeah, that where, where the mouse is pointing, pointing to the triplet uh, the magnets, and then uh, outside to the outside part of the of the of the IP, you can see the typical photo 
lattice, the, 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 the structure with the quadrupoles, and before there is a, in light blue or greenish uh, the, the bending magnets. So, but as, as, as um, when we arrive to the AP, we, we squeeze the beams, and actually on the on the left pictures, you can see in the two planes, X and Y, and top and bottom, the, the, the aperture that was measured in 2018. And you see that um, in gray, the, these are the parts of the, the mechanical, mechanical parts of the, of the beam pipe. So the, the, the limits that we have uh, physically um, for the beam to get through and the measure aperture. And, and you see that actually uh, for, for 10 sigma, it basically touches the, the, the mechanical structure. So this is our limit. And this, is, this was done for, for, for the, the, the lowest possible beta star value. So the, how, how much we can squeeze. So the 25 centimeter beta. Um, and so that so this is very important. We cannot go lower. And, and also, it's a bit um, the, the the picture might be a bit tilted because this is something that you might not have heard about before. But the, all the experiments they operate at the crossing angle, so we don't want to have any. So of, of course, like we in in it's very like specifically also for the LHC that we have thousands of bunches. We have um, in the nominal op operations about two thousand eight hundred bunches. Um, we could have like in, in the in the length we actually could have a bit more, but we need to 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 leave space for the upward gap so that the rising uh, current in the kicker magnet that keeps kicks them out have time to actually act. Uh, so we have this 2,800 bunches, and we need to apply this crossing angle so that we don't have the the collisions around the IP because in that part the the, the two beams are actually actually uh, traveling in the in the common beam pipe. So as long as they, they are around the LHC, they are in separated separated beam pipes. But around the IP, in this distance of of um, around 50 meters or so, they, they are uh, traveling in the same beam pipes. So we need to separate them somehow. Okay, I think Andres wants to show something. Yep. So uh, I I wanted to let you finish it. So I can go ahead and welcome you guys to the CMS experiment. So we're going through what we call the visitors platform. So if you had the chance to visit CMS, this is the view that you would have at this point in time. So the detector configuration is always different. We mentioned these slices. So when you come visit, it will, I think next year especially, will very much look different. These, um, this shield, this orange uh, shields will be, let's say, shut around the beam, well, around the, the, this region of the beam pipe. And you can sort of see uh, the beam pipe going through this uh, disc. Uh, this is part of the, uh, the muon end cap. And you can really see what we mean by a slice. So this is just a wheel or a disc, and it's really the end cap of the muon system. And you can imagine that this entire thing was assembled at the surface, and then it was brought down the shaft, which is, I'll show you guys in a little bit, but it's just overhead. And uh, I'm gonna now go ahead, and I can show you again in the beam pipe, but I, you know, the really cool thing about these visits is that this is all you would see if you were here in person, but of course, uh, we are gonna show you guys a bit more than that. So maybe we can go, should we go this way or that way? That way. Okay. So we're uh, making our way to the plus side, right? Yes. So uh, if I recall correctly, this end points to towards the Jura Mountains. And it's, uh, it's a very symmetric detector. So this is what we call the calorimeter end cap or calorimeter nose. And uh, this is actually very nice because you can see that it's sort of built into, the, in, into one of the muon wheels or muon discs. And you can see on the other side, the rest of the detector. Now, I'm just gonna try to highlight here with my finger. Let's see if I can manage this. So here you see this, see this sort of uh, just the, the edge of what is a cylinder. And that actually corresponds to the super, superconducting solenoid at CMS. 
So it's six meters in inner diameter, and we already talked a bit about it, but uh, it generates about uh, 3.8 Tesla of current, oh, sorry, of magnetic field. And within that volume, we have most of our detectors. So uh, Joanna already described to you the tracking system, which has the pixel and the tracker uh, detectors. And then around that, we have the two calorimeters. But all of that is inside of that central region. And then outside of that, as you can see, this sort of silver and red sections. So that is all dedicated to the muon system. And it is really, is, uh, it kind of gives you a sense of like this to us, right? To particle physicists, this, this is what we would consider a small or compact detector. And the reason is because of that strong magnetic field. Um, so uh, the, the, the fact that the magnetic field is so strong means that we can keep the dimensions of our detector a bit smaller and actually keep all or most of the detector within the magnet. And then outside of the magnet, all these red sections that you see, those are actually iron. And we have a lot of iron in there. So there's 12,500 tons. Um, the total weight of the detector is 14,000 tons, which is about twice the weight of the Eiffel Tower. But those, the, the iron in the muon system, in the barrel and in the end cap, it, will, it, it forms part of the magnetic system. It's what we call the return yoke. So we have still a quite powerful, a two Tesla magnetic field in the muon system. So outside of the magnet itself. So I think I'll walk around a bit more and maybe hand it over to you, Joanna, uh, if you have more comments or any, right, any um, other, yeah. And maybe at some point you can show that there is, if, if there is still some um, residual uh, magnetization around in the cavern, because actually a couple of weeks back, we finished a, a test run at LHC. So there was a beam first time in three years a uh, circle like the, there were some tests like basically commissioning of, of of the detectors in preparation for the for the coming grand three which is starting um early next year so there so now we are in the, in the period of a lot of, of the shutdown but since starting next year um for a few years nobody or of course with short breaks but nobody will be uh, ever, um, like allowed to walk around the cavern like hundreds is now so it's a good time to make a visit in the cavern um so maybe um, yeah, you're just showing uh, things around. So maybe with questions. Some, yeah, maybe if you have some questions now, because that's a good time. I'm not sure if we don't hear you or there are no questions. You can just like show with your heads because I see you. Okay, uh, from from outside. Through Q and A. Not sure if we can hear them. Oh, I'm sorry. We actually we realized that the microphone went out of power. Oh, okay. And now I've switched it to the laptop computer. Are there questions from your side? Yes. Uh, 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 oh, what's the diameter of? Could you please get closer to the microphone? Yeah, we cannot hear we you. Don't hear you. Maybe the mic you can. So the question is about the diameter of the track detector. And um, so for the tracker, I'm not not sure. Something how, like three meters. Something about something. three meters, yes. Okay, and this um, this very innermost part is what is the diameter of that one? So that it's smaller. So yeah, so it's basically that uh, the tracker is the most inner part, but it's it has the a pixel inside the, its its layer, and that I've heard it's the size of the shoe box. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a, it's slightly it's, bigger, yeah, but it's yeah, a, it's not. Well, it was a little bit bigger. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's barrel. I think it might be a half a meter or so. Mm -hmm. But the cables uh, and the the auxiliary stuff. Around it, yeah. They they yeah. reach up to the end of the tracker, so yes. Actually, the the cartridges were pretty big. So happy to see them. <laughs> okay, have more questions? Yeah. What's the window? Yeah. Okay, that's a good question. Why do we have two similar detectors in the LHC? 
Right, that's a good question. So um, we have the two detectors, um, which are a general purpose because um, it's, a, it's an important thing to cross, cross check the, um, like if there was a discovery, for example, the Higgs discovery, um, it's, uh, it, it needs to be validated somehow, right? So the two independent detectors, um, like, because they, they are completely different, like we pointed out already some differences, but there are many things, they, they're completely different groups, different scientists working in completely different ways, um, apart from the, the, the technical aspects of the detectors. So uh, yeah, so it's just a confirmation basically of the measurement. They have different systematics. Mm -hmm. So if, the, yeah. if the, the result is the same, despite the different systematics, you might get the, the impression that what you see is really not an artifact. Yeah. So that's why, for example, we have two completely different approach on the mirror momentum measurement. Uh, our, our approach, what, what you want to measure, of, sorry, may I? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So for, to measure the mirror momentum, uh, oh, yes. you want to measure, yes. you want to fit uh, the helix or the curvature nice of the mirror path. Well, in order to make a good fit, you need a, a sizable curvature. So just a very, very small fraction is not enough. You can reach it two ways. One is that you put the, the muon in a, in a high magnetic field, what we do. And then, of course, in a, in a restricted volume, you get the, the good uh, curvature. Or you let it fly in a much smaller magnetic field. That's what the atlas does. But in in this case, the atlas needs to have a large detector, very, uh, very low density detector. So it means that they need beams. Is it okay to go over these? Sorry? No, I think uh, I'm sorry, I forgot I was unmuted. Uh, <laughs> but, but maybe I can just very quickly uh, show you guys a few things and then hand it back to you guys. Hey, so, go okay, okay, go ahead. So this is uh, a very up close view uh, of one of the uh, CSCs. So this is a cathode strip chamber. And uh, this is, so you can see there's these modules. These are gaseous detectors. Uh, I think John already described a bit the, the muon system, but I really wanted to show you, you know, we have in front of us, uh, I think a great view of one of the slices. So, and you can really see how snug it is in here. So when everything is closed, uh, you'll see, we have a colleague up there saying hi, hey. So um, yeah, when everything is close, it's, everything is very close together, very, uh, very dense. Uh, but I re really wanted to show you guys the shaft. So you can see that directly, we're directly below the new beam pipe, uh, which we can talk about in a little bit, but you can see the, basically the surface. So that's a hundred meters above us. It doesn't look super impressive from this view, but it's really a long way up. Uh, I wonder if I can show you really specifically. So there is, I don't know if you can see this. So there is sort of a gap in that, in the concrete, in the, in the white section. And there's actually a slab of concrete and we can actually cover up uh, when the detector's running, that's, you, you cannot really see the surface. It's actually covered up by this slab of concrete. So since we're down here, maybe we can go around. Actually, very quickly, we will demonstrate as what you were saying, Joanna. We can talk about the residual magnetic field. But first, let me show you. We're going to do this with what we call the, the feet. And these orange feet are actually part of the way, that the, the way that we can move these detector slices. So you can see these cables. And you see that they go all the way to this machine at the end. But essentially, we can pump compressed air down these feet. And with enough air pressure, you really reduce most of the friction. These are super, super heavy, but yeah, you can sort of lift them up just a little bit, just like, uh, like air hockey and just slide them around, which you have to be very careful about and do it very, very slowly. And as we said, most of the parts that are painted red are steel. And after being exposed to 3.8 Tesla, these, uh, Oh, they're individual ones, okay. So these sections, these slabs of steel are still magnetized. So I'm just gonna use a regular paper clip. There's no magic, there, there are no special paper clips here. They're just regular paper clips. You can see, <laughs> so you can see that especially towards the edges of the steel, 
they're very much magnetized and they just stay there and uh it's very fun to play with these guys uh and i think noemi has like a, a, a record of how many she can sort of put together and keep them <laughs> without falling i don't know how to do it she has the magic touch on how to get them but yeah it's very interesting to see this residual magnetic field in action here well of course you use the fact that at the edges the magnetic field is stronger <laughs> Yeah, and there's many, many aspects to this. You know, right now the the, the magnet is off, um, uh, but when it's on, it, there's different safety precautions. And then right when we have visitors, for example, you need to like legally speaking, you need to make sure that you tell people that if they have a pacemaker, it, that's that's a risk in in some areas of CMS. So we do even have to measure the magnetic fields and see how much exactly visitors will be exposed to and that's sort of part of commissioning or, or making sure that visitors can uh yeah check out the detector itself not it, so you might imagine well you just make sure there's not enough radiation but there's a lot more to it than that okay so maybe i can hand it over to you guys um and we'll just show you guys i think if we have time we can show you guys a different view maybe go upstairs yeah i think that's a good idea so in the, in the meantime, I may um, like tell you a bit about the beam pipe that um, Andres was showing showing you before. Um, so it was actually recently in, the, in this shutdown, it was exchanged. So it's already a beam pipe that uh, at CMS it was um, exchanged for the, for the one that will be used in the upgrades. And so for the um, for for the coming run, this is still a part of the of the. Um, a few few years run of this of the same let's say LHC running period, but then in after that, we have we'll have a few years of break, and there are major upgrades coming. So then, um, and one of them basically is this, this exchange of the beam pipe. So and, and basically, um, inside when where where we have the proton beams, uh, we have a, um, a, like ultra vacuum. So it's actually better than the the, the, the vacuum is better there than in the outer space, and um, uh, yeah, to make sure that we don't have any. Um, um, like anything on the way of the beams, and uh, it's aluminium on the on the where as you can see it, but actually in the in the very central part of, of CMS, it's uh, made of beryllium berly, berly, because we have to take care of, of about the uh, the activation of materials, so they have to be light and um, um, so that we don't see any um, activation like secondary effects in inside our um, detectors, um, you know, as as a background instead of the real signal that we want to observe. So. Um, Andres, you want to show something interesting? Sure. So we're actually making our way upstairs, and uh, maybe just as a quick note, I can show you the, show you guys the world famous HF garage. So there's actually a part of our detector that's completely missing right now, and it is inside of this yellow uh, the the garage with the yellow doors. Um, and HF is the forward section of the hydronic calorimeter, and it's it's grounded. It's it's we keep it in there because uh, it didn't behave so well. No, I'm just kidding. So uh, it's in there because that's the last thing we install. You you can imagine that we have to push all of the slices together to make room to have this sort of uh, hydronic forward system put right uh, behind the end cap of the muon system. All right, so we will go up just a few more floors. It's four, four floors, right? So even though we say it's a compact detector, it's not really that small. So we're now uh, towards the top of the detector itself. And yeah, we'll just go around. And you can really see this very interesting view. It's actually. You know, every time you're down here, it looks a bit different. Here you can see that one of the, you can see the CSCs through the, I think these are mostly RPCs on this disc or, yeah. yeah. So the, the red disc is mostly RPCs, which are resistive plate chambers. Uh, the other side. Yeah, so there's, yeah, there's different, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just saying we cannot hear Noemi, so maybe you can repeat. Uh, so what Noemi was saying is that in this red wheel, 
there's a layer of RPCs, then there's a layer of CSCs, and there are another layer of RPCs. So they're sort of interleaved. But the, I would say the RPCs are sort of the fast detectors. We use them in the trigger system. And we're actually just commissioning, and uh, Sultan and Noemi are heavily involved with this new project. It's called the GEM chambers, the GEM detectors. And these are also very fast detector. These are sort of next generation. And CMS has installed the GE11 uh, on the minus side of CMS. Uh, unfortunately, I, yeah, so okay, we, they also have the GE1 slash two, which is installed in the other side. Should we go up here or just keep going? Yeah. Uh, so that's a next generation gem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, let me, let me show you guys just up to here. You can see that even with this super uh, unrestricted behind the scenes view, there's places we can't take you because even, even though the magnet is off, the cryogenics are operational. I don't, we, yeah, so we, can, we cannot go through this. Uh, if you look yeah, through this, go... uh, this grill, uh, Andres, yes, yeah, can... exactly. In the background, you might see, yeah, exactly. You see that vessel. That vessel is a five cubic meter liquid helium vessel. And this is the, this is the buffer before the, the helium is sprayed on the, uh, the magnet. And since it is full now, uh, this, place is, uh, is forbidden to go. Right, right. because it, it brings our the superconducting magnet. It, it keeps it at, at four kelvins mm -hmm. yeah, to make it uh, so powerful. Yeah, but indeed, even though we can only go up to this little corner, it's a really cool view. Uh, so we'll keep going and uh, I'll pass it all over to you guys upstairs. OK, so maybe it's the time for, for some more questions, or maybe you can tell us what, what else uh, is interesting, what you want to see, or Anything from the outside? Yeah. Okay. We heard everything. Uh, are there more questions, comments? Yes, please. Uh, the magnetization of all the of all the components in the literal one. Do we, is it, do we actually have to account for that in, when we calculate our? Yeah. Our so better? so the question is for the analysis of the tracks or for the operation of the detector of this magnetization of the iron or of the what we just have seen of the support structure around the detector, if that has here? Been taken into account. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this was the remanent field, the remanent magnetization. Once you turn on the magnet, the, the magnetization of, the, of the, the red slabs go up to two Tesla, at least in that region, which is yeah. uh, uh, concerned for the, for the tracking. So, so the, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Mark, so Mark. I think this is probably the last view that we will show you. I think we're running a bit out of time. So any other things in the detector that anyone wants to see, please let me know now. I think we're otherwise gonna start heading upstairs. Yeah, any comments from the audience? No? Maybe. Maybe Andres, if you pass by the, the bottom floor, you could you could show yourself in front of the CMS for the scale. It's mm -hmm. yeah, okay, I, so... I'm not sure I'm not sure if we mentioned the dimensions, but uh, yeah, CMS. Yeah, is well, a, so, so Joanna's suggesting that I stand in front for scale. Um, I, we can do that right now if I go towards the end. Yeah. Do you think that will work? So, uh, so the uh, dimensions, if I recall correctly, it's uh, 15 meters tall or in diameter, uh, and uh, it is. 25, I don't remember, 25 or 30 meters in length. Um, and yeah, about twice as heavy as the Eiffel Tower. Hopefully me standing here gives you a sense of uh, really how big the detector is. Um, this is a four story building in size. Yeah, uh, yeah all the stairs that Andres had to cover before he ended up there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good workout. Okay. So maybe we'll start heading upstairs and just hand it over to you guys. Right. So you, so you see the complicated structure. There are like many cables outside. You can see uh, to take care of all the like millions of channels for the readout that uh, um, uh, that we that we take out from the detector. Um, 
there are many um, like interesting um, aspects, also engineering aspects about this detector. Um, like Andres mentioned before, the the the, the pillows that make us uh, able to move the slices around. But there's also like you can see the black uh, um, kind of like stripes on the side. Could you of hold the camera just like. So uh, Joanna, maybe very quickly, I can point out, you see the beam pipe here and it's, uh, we're very careful about the beam pipe. This is brand new and basically irreplaceable. And you can see, uh, let me see, right here, there's a little rope that goes all the way to the top. So that's a temporary support. While the detector is open like this, uh, we wanna make sure that we have support for that beam pipe. Uh, so right now, this is sort of the, the solution for that. Mm. I think that's quite an interesting point what Andrew said about being irreplaceable, that a lot of things here, um, we cannot seem to go and buy them because they're not in stock anywhere. <laughs> so, for example, how many years were you working on the luminometer that you guys were building? Yeah, I mean, we constantly work on it. <laughs> <laughs> the point that it's also like all this, like the, what we are saying about the beam pipe is the case for, for many other subsystems. So they are constantly exchanged. Like, for example, in, in last summer, like we exchanged our, the, the luminometer that we use, but there was also the pixel bar barrel was fully exchanged. Um, and so this is all for, for the preparation for the next years, but um, it's, it's a con constantly evolving environment. Yeah, constantly basically. being improved. So um, usually, usually we try to design our system such a way that we okay. have uh, spare parts and mm -hmm. we can swap them in if it is possible and if it is needed. Right. The beam pipe, on contrary, is not like this. Uh, this beam pipe has been down. designed for the, the phase two uh, LHC operations or detector operations, and there is only one. It took two years to build it. Mm -hmm. uh, there are not too many places on, on this planet where this can be produced. We ordered this from yeah. California, mm -hmm. Sorry. and, well, and they... Fine. And they <laughs> actually just claim that this is the last beam pipe they put for, for us. <laughs> so we are we are extremely paranoid when we when we talk about the beam pipe. And I think this is understandable. I have the price tag. This was two million. <laughs> so on the other hand, uh, but but of course we don't have any replacement for that. If anything happens to this beam pipe we have to put back in the the old beam pipe which has different aperture conditions mm -hmm. yeah. and also this beam pipe right is kind of made uh for the high lumi as well to make yep. sure that so so if something happens mm -hmm. with this beam pipe then kind of the plans for the future of the cms detector would also have to change exactly it's built perfectly for what's coming up in the future and that's also like a quite uh, impressive like there's plans years into the future of what CMS is going to look like and it's constantly being I know my friends some of my friends who worked done PhDs about things that might happen in 10 years at CMS <laughs> and, uh, and you know it's uh, yeah it takes time a lot of, uh, of this right also like that's also the case for the the calorimeter the equal that I was saying before that the, the crystals that they used there they were basically grown uh, in the lab so it also took a lot of time to to, to prepare each of these seventy five thousand uh, crystals that and were. And now put they inside. have to change them. And now they have to change them. During right? LS three. Because they have the limited time. Uh, yeah, exactly. They 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 yeah. develop the the color cells inside the the color centers, and as they grow, the the crystals get darker and darker. Yeah. And this has a primary impact on the yield. The measurement. Yeah. <clears throat> Andres, you want to say something? Uh, well, I, I wanted to say a few more words about ECAL, and I hope we don't lose you. Typically, going up, we don't lose you guys. But yeah, ECAL is fascinating because, uh, as you mentioned, there's like 75,000 of these crystals, and they each had to be grown in the lab. That took two days each. So in total, this process, I think, was eight or eight to 10 years, something like that. Uh, they should so be yeah, crystals without any crystal yes. problems, crystal errors. Exactly. They have to be very pure and they have to be characterized, they have to be transparent, and you have to be able to, you know, we shoot lasers into them to figure out how opaque or how transparent they are exactly. And uh, yeah, it, but I, I think one of what I find interesting is you tell somebody, yeah, that there's 75,000 of these, took 10 years to put them there. That to me counts as irreplaceable. And, uh, but it also tells you a lot about the lifetime of this sort of experiment. So the, the process, the work involved, of, you know, from proposing a new detector to basically um, showing every, demonstrating that is a very mature technology enough to get funding for it and go through a lot of reviews to show that you can run this thing. 
and then to actually installing it, commissioning, operating it. And it's cool that Jonah and I have been, uh, you know, involved with part of this process, but we didn't, we weren't around when, when these were, uh, you know, proposed originally. Uh, so there's, there's, it's just, that's why you need such a large collaboration. Uh, very quickly, as an example, this picture here is of the pre-shower, which is not a subsystem that a lot of people talk about. It's kind of technically part of the electromagnetic calorimeter, but not really, because it has a lot of silicon sensors. So it's, it's meant to sort of differentiate between the, the different particles. So it's very interesting. But my point is that there's now a proposed new detector for high Lumi that's going to be in, it's going to replace this actual, uh, the calorimeter nose or the, the end calorimeter end cap. And it's going to be there. And it's going to be more or less like this guy. It's going to be a lot of silicon sensors with some uh, calorimeter, you know, scintillating calorimeters as well. Right. So for, for example, for, for the primary uh, version of CMS, it took about like 20 years from the, like the, the concept of the experiment uh, through the like production and the, the construction. So it's uh, yeah, quite a long time. As well as a lot of manpower, a lot of different people right. from different mm -hmm. parts of the world. Right. Many countries. Uh, yeah, I'm just, just checking uh, the, the radiation uh, that he... Yeah, we yeah, have to draw the attention to the 0 0.00. Right. <laughs> Okay, and he's coming back here. So time for questions, if there are any. I would also encourage the, the online connected attendees. They can ask the questions through the Q&A. We can point to the, the dump button. Oh yeah. Okay, Beam dump. I don't kill the... <laughs> don't, don't press it. <laughs> okay, I will ask. Um, you are disconnected. So we have, we have one question here in the, in the room. It's about redundancy, right? Because we saw so many cables and devices on the, on the images um, that there's, uh, of course, an obvious question, if one of these components fails, do you have some redundancy in the detector? Right, you, yes, you, like you have millions of channels basically. So if some of them die, if yeah, if what, like 10 out of millions die, you, you have to live with it, right? So you, like you, during operations, you cannot just go down and exchange a part. Of course, there are periods like um, towards the end of the year, sometimes there are a few weeks of break so that the, the cool down, so the, the, the radiation levels go, can go down so somebody can access the cavern and exchange a piece of the detector. But, but usually you just, you just have to live with it. Yeah, and, and also you enter this uh, information in the, the uh, Monte Carlo simulations the detector description so right. so in this case uh you can you can have a, a simulation that is in line with the with the physics measurements yeah so you can foresee what's the level or like how how much uh, the materials you put inside can uh, withstand yeah so you, you try to prevent that of course but if something happens if the, the, the accident happens or something just breaks then get closer yeah. <laughs> Actually, that happened in the in the last run for for PLT for your luminometer. Wait, let's not talk about it. No, <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's. I mean, I think part of the point is that ultimately things will break, and you have to do the best you can to figure out why they broke, and you have to figure out how to, you know, work around any problems that, uh, because you, you don't just go like, well, it broke, too bad. You really have to work on it to see if you can recover the data somehow or, uh, yeah, just do the best you can to also understand how this happened. And once you have, if you have and when you have a chance to replace it or repair it, uh, figure out how to, yeah, how, how to prevent it from happening in the future, basically. Okay. There are more questions? No, I think at the moment we, we are running out of questions here. Okay, we don't have any from the, the online connected people. 
should we wrap up? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Some final um, <laughs> so maybe uh, to wrap up a question for you guys, what is your favorite particle and why? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think electron. It's so so I don't know mundane, <laughs> most useful, right? <laughs> well, without them, we don't have chemistry and biology. <laughs> <laughs> The only thing that comes to my mind right now because I just spent one week working on the hackathon of B tagging so the B quark. <laughs> I, I appreciate B quark a lot. <laughs> it makes physics analysis. And and if you think about it, there's kind of an entire detector dedicated to mm. B physics, right? Mm -hmm. So it's very, right. very interesting. Yeah. I was I've actually always been really jealous of people at LHCB because I was just thinking, oh man, it looks like such a great experiment. <laughs> CMS is great too. <laughs> I think I mean I think we 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 are all all the four are are very unique and very, very yes. interesting and very nice. So then do you have a favorite particle? Well, probably the Higgs. It is as, as heavy as I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I don't get my my yeah. weight is not related to the, not concerned to the Higgs boson. <laughs> no. My weight is created by the by the binding energy of the chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Cool. So maybe I would say the muon. I just like muons. So, true CMS guy. Yeah, yeah true yeah. CMS guy. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, maybe we can. If there's no more questions, we can maybe close. Anything? So thank you very much for for joining us today. So it actually, I can I can tell I think would be helpful you as well that we enjoyed very much this visit yep. today. And um, thanks. Thank you guys for joining. Exactly, and and let's meet again. Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully on site at some point. You, you're sure. not that far, so exactly yeah, at some point it should be possible. Okay. Okay, then let Can me also to say know? let me say a few words. Uh, we, I think we enjoyed that uh, that visit a lot, and it shows. I mean, the detector shows an enormous complexity, right? And it's particularly, I think, uh, impressive to see that this is the result of of the work of so many people, right? And only if they work in a coordinated way, you can you can make this thing work. And I think also for the students, it was very interesting. So many thanks for our sites. Of course, we, from our side, of course, we would have enjoyed much more to, to go to CERN and to take a personal look at the things. But uh, I think this, this visit was also very impressive, in particular, since the person with the camera uh, could walk into regions that you could not walk into with a, with a group. And yeah, we, uh, our course is about accelerators, so I guess we were most interested in the beam pipe. We saw that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks again, and, and thanks again for your effort. It was very professionally made, I would say. And yeah, thanks to there were no gaps. Yeah, thanks to our, like, uh, uh, Zoltan and pleasure. Noemi who took care of that. Uh, it was my pleasure. Thanks okay. very much for coming. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye. Thank you, bye.